Good morning and welcome to our final virtual Sunday worship for 2020. This has been a year like no other. With this pandemic, many of us feel so helpless, so lost, and so disconnected. But yet, in these dark times, we must continue to proclaim the light of this world, of Jesus as our shepherd and our king, and that we are his people and his sheep. For some of us, maybe we feel like we have hit that wall, that we are so powerless, but we know that Jesus has the power to do the things that we cannot do. Our Lord and Savior and our shepherd, he has no limitations. He doesn't give up. So let's get started today with this last Sunday worship of 2020 with our call to worship. Our call to worship today is found in Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. We are his people, sheep of his flock. Indeed, we are his people, and yes, we declare that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. And our profession of faith today is found in John 10, verses 14 to 15, as well as verse 28. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Let's now take some time for us to confess our sins. For God is holy, and he cannot tolerate sin. We sin, our iniquities become a separation between us and God. If we confess, we are forgiven. Our confession today is found in Psalm 78, verse 52, and 56 to 57. Lord led up his people like sheep. He guided them in the wilderness like a flock, but they tested and rebelled against the Most High God. They turned away and acted treacherously. Let's now take a moment to silently confess before our Lord and let us bow our heads and confess together. This is also a time where you may pause and take more time to confess as needed. Father in heaven, hear our cries to you and our prayers to you. For we have sinned against you in ways great and small, both in our words and in our deeds. We have placed idols before us, turned away from you, and relied upon our own understanding. And we have not loved you with our whole heart. And Lord, in our sin, we have tried to hide from you, ignore those whom you have sent, and rebelled against your love. We just ask now, that you do not cast us out from your presence, but be merciful and hear our confessions. Lord, we are ashamed and we are sorry for all that we have done to displease you. Help us now to live in your light and walk in your ways. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Lord is good and he is merciful. He will pardon all those who truly confess and repent. He will create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Our assurance of salvation is found in Psalm, verses 1 to 3. O shepherd of Israel, you led Joseph like a flock. Come save us. Restore us, O God. We will be saved. 
Now let's sing songs of praises together with our worship team.
Brothers and sisters, this is the time for me to make a very important announcement. As you know, this has been a very unusual year with the pandemic, and our congregation meeting in May has been postponed. But thanks to all of you and your permission, we are now going to be able to hold a virtual congregation meeting on January 15th, 2021. Now, many of you will have already received an email from the church going through how we're going to go about this virtual congregation meeting. And right now, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some of the changes that we are going to have to make in order, for this con in order for this congregation meeting to proceed smoothly forward. And again, I'm going to speak to you, but if you think that uh, I'm going too quickly, feel free to pause and start reading what's on the slide. You may also refer to the email that has been sent to you. So the first thing is, the meeting will be on January 15th, Friday evening at 7 p.m., and we're going to do it on Zoom. So all members will be receiving a link prior to this meeting. We're going to send that out in early January. We're asking that all members attend, because even though this is a virtual meeting, we still need a quorum. And because it is a virtual meeting, we're gonna do things a little bit differently than before. What we're gonna do is we're gonna send a ballot to all members. So each and every one of you will receive by mail a ballot that is sent to you. We're asking that you vote after you've attended the meeting. With that ballot, there will also be a self-addressed stamped envelope that you can put your ballot in and mail it back to church. We're gonna remind you to sign your name and also print your name on that envelope so we know 
who you are and, uh, and the fact that you have voted. Rest assured, though, we're going to have a process where your vote is going to be counted by a separate person than the one who's going to open the envelope. So there will be a two-step process to maintain confidentiality of your ballot. We're trying to do this because we're only going to count the ballots returned from those who have attended the meeting. So on the Zoom meeting, we're going to be taking attendance. This is very much the same as what we do for our congregation meeting. For those of you who cannot make the virtual congregation meeting, we're asking you to notify us by email no, no later than January the 8th. The reason that we need you to notify us is because if you don't notify us and we also do not see you at the Zoom meeting, your ballot will not be counted. Those are the procedures that we're going to go by, and this is what we have decided as a church leadership. So we hope to see all of you there on January 15th, and for whatever reason that you cannot join us, please notify us ahead of time no later than January 8th. Thank you very much, and if you have more questions, please feel free to contact the church office and also refer to your email. Thank you. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7 and 11. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Um, good morning and, and welcome to the last Sunday of 2020. Um, and I kind of want to continue a little bit further on to the Christmas theme. And we're going to look at Joseph and Mary going down to Bethlehem. But then ask the question, why Bethlehem? And what does their going to Bethlehem tell us? And that what we learn is, if we look at some of the scripture in the background of the Old Testament, that Jesus is born as the King Messiah, but he's also born as a shepherd. And what I need you to know, and I'm going to try to get through this, is that in the Old Testament, shepherds actually are not referred to as like the spiritual leader, not the pastor. It's the king. But it talks about an aspect of the king being caring. And then the king, the Messiah, has power. And this is really important because essentially, as I prayed about this passage, I thought about parenting and how we as parents need a shepherd who cares for our children and we need a king who has power. And the reason is that we hit a wall. And, and I originally was thinking about like hitting the wall of parental love, but that's not really a good thing. And when I talk about hitting a wall... I'm just thinking about marathon runners. You know, when you run long distance, you reach a certain point where you just kind of can't keep running any longer, 
And, and marathon runners or long distance runners refer to it as hitting the wall. And, and parents, we hit a wall, and, and usually we don't hit a wall of our love. We hit the wall of our ability to really care for our children and to protect our children. And, and what I kind of want to do toward the end is come back to this as an application, is because Jesus is a shepherd who cares and a king who has power, and we have our Heavenly Father in heaven, that we can pray to God. We can pray to God. But we need to pray to God persistently for our children because we have a limitation. And whether they're young, we need to pray beforehand so that they grow up and don't develop problems. Right now, perhaps, we need to pray because we're anticipating but haven't really seen problems with our kids maybe going back to school. Or we have problems that we sense with our children. Maybe they've gone off and uh, are in college or got graduated from college, and we sense that something is not right, but we don't know what they are. And, of course, we always want protection. And so what I want to suggest is that we pray persistently for our children, that we pray so persistent, but we do so prior to any problems arising, and that we present not only problems that we know about, problems our kids tell us, problems that we're very aware of, but problems that we sense, maybe our fears about our children. We sense that something is not right. We sense maybe they've been hurt. We sense maybe they're in a bad relationship. We sense that maybe they're not walking with the Lord or they're doing something that's not good or godly that is going to harm them, and we plead for God's protection. And we can do this because of who God is as our Father in heaven. He is truly their Father that Jesus Christ is born as a shepherd. He cares, he nurtures, he seeks out, he brings back those that are lost. And that Jesus is also the Messiah King who has power and he comes in the name, the character of God, so that he will love and bring back our children and he can actually transcend all of the things that we cannot. So uh, let me pray and just ask God, for his power. I pray to you, Almighty God, that you will speak to us. I pray that you'll help me to speak accurately. I pray, Almighty God, that you, Lord, will motivate us to pray for our children, pray for our grandchildren, pray for our children's children, pray for other people's children, in a way, God, that will activate, God, your power, and that will zero you in on the problems our children have as we present those problems to you, and we ask you, God, that you will motivate us to pray persistently, to pray regularly, and to pray until problems are resolved. In your name I pray. Amen. So this has been a kind of interesting week for animals. And, you know, sometimes I look at these strange articles on the news. And perhaps you've seen um, this carrot the deer. And I think it's up in Ontario, Ontario Canada. And a particular man has seen and taken pictures of a deer, and, and you probably can't see it too clearly, but he has called this deer Carrot, and Carrot has an arrow. So somebody, uh, a hunter, has been shooting a bow and arrow, and the arrow went into the top of the head, and it comes out the bottom. And he seems to be okay. He doesn't seem to be brain dead, obviously, because he's alive. He seems to be functioning. But he's been really concerned, so he called, you know, the local Department of Conservation, Natural Resources, and they sent out, you know, some veterinarians. And, and what they did is they came out um, to help this deer. And, and, and I say this because sometimes our kids get wounded. We got to call out to God in the same way this particular man called out to the Department of Natural Resources knowing that he himself did not have the ability to take care of Carrot, the deer, he called out, we need to call out to God and ask God to come and take care of our children if we ever see that they're hurting, if we ever see that they're wounded, if we ever see that they're kind of struggling with a lot of anxiety, things going around and around in their mind or things that are weighing in their heart, maybe they're depressed. And so what uh, they did was they came out and at first, when we read the articles, they thought, well, what they're, they're not going to take the arrow out because the deer might just bleed to death and bleed out. And they were just going to kind of snip it on the top and snip it on the bottom, thinking that it would occlude the bleeding and it would not bleed out. But so they shot an arrow or they shot, a, they shot the deer with a dart, tranquilized it, went. And when they went to go cut the arrow off, they found that they were actually able to completely renew, remove 
the arrow. And that's what we need to do with God, is we need to call to God when we see that our children are hurt and pray that God will come and heal. Because there's a very real limit to what we can actually do to heal our children. And there's a very real limit to what we can do to really cause our children to become healthy, especially once they've moved away. Um, and, and another thing that I saw this weekend was that there's this EMT or a paramedic in Thailand, and he's riding along, and he comes up to the scene of an accident, and it's not, an, a, not a usual accident. Essentially what happens is there's a little tiny baby elephant lying in the road, and then there's a motorcyclist or a, that's sitting off on the side of the road and the motorcyclist is hurt and so of course being a paramedic and an EMT he runs out to go to help and they find out that the motorcyclist is actually he's kind of okay but the elephant is lying there in the middle of the street blocking the road and, and he's actually appears to be dead so being an EMT and a paramedic what does he do what does he do you know he goes I guess he went to Red Cross you know, you put your fingers down, go to the bottom of the sternum, work your way up, and he did all of his compressions, and he brought the elephant back to life. He brought this baby elephant who was essentially dead back to life. And I think, you know, this kind of reminds us of our own baby children. They're babies as young children, but sometimes they walk off away from the Lord. Sometimes they go off and they do things that are hurtful to them. They do things that are contrary to what God wants. It appears as though they're spiritually dead, as they have kind of closed their hearts off, or you fear that they've closed their hearts off. And yet we can call to God to come and to kind of give them spiritual CPR if you want. But we have to do this in prayer. And so as we look at this Christmas passage, I want to focus in on Jesus as shepherd, a shepherd who cares, and Jesus as king, a king who has power. And of course, the story is so familiar to us, and we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So we come to Luke, and we see that Joseph goes off to the city of David, and at first you might think he's talking about Jerusalem, so you, we realize Luke specifically adds city of David, but not the Jerusalem city of David, Bethlehem the city of David. And then it says that he took along with him Mary. And you kind of wonder why Mary was with child who was almost ready to give birth would leave. Why wouldn't she just stay with her mother? And then why does he call her his betrothed? Why does he say he is like almost engaged to her? And you kind of scratch your mind and you go over to Matthew 2 and you see, well, you know, Joseph was told by the angel to go ahead and to marry her. Don't be afraid to take her as your wife. And it says that he did take her as a wife. So you kind of wonder, why does Luke call her his betrothed? But then you go to Matthew, and you see very, very clearly at the end of Matthew 1, that it says that he, Ma Joseph took Mary as his wife. They got married, but he kept her a virgin until she gave birth. And so when it calls Mary his betrothed, as though they're still engaged, it's probably not that they haven't had the legal marriage. It's that they have not consummated the marriage physically. So she's with child. Why is she with child? Why would somebody who's ready to give birth, and here that's what it tells us, that they go down to Bethlehem, and that while she is there, she gives birth to her firstborn son. Firstborn son. And this is kind of a shock to a few people, because some of us think Jesus is her only son, but uh, if you go and you look at the Sinaitis, you realize, you know, that she had five, five boys, I think. And she gives birth while she's there. But why does she go? Well, probably because there was a lot of gossip in Nazareth at this girl who gets pregnant and she marries this guy and it looks like they're rushed. And so I assume that the reason that she went along rather than staying with her mother and other family members that would take care of her until she gives birth, that the gossip was so bad that perhaps she felt like she couldn't stay. But what happens there? When she gives birth in Bethlehem, the angels come out to the shepherds and say, born in the city of David, not Jerusalem, but Bethlehem, is two things, a savior, and that's a word that Gentiles would relate to. Christ the Lord, the Messiah the Lord. That's something that the Jews would understand. And so even right here, you kind of see Savior, Christ the Lord, the Messiah. 
that already it's very clear that Jesus has come both to Gentiles and to Jews. And there's going to be three things, and the three things that I really want us to focus in on are Jesus comes as a, a shepherd that's like David. A shepherd that is like David. That secondly, he comes as a shepherd that comes from all eternity, but what that means is he comes from God as God. He comes from God as God, and as God, he has the characteristics of God. And then finally, finally, he comes as a shepherd who cares. So he comes as a shepherd who cares, but he also has the power of a king. So we're going to look at these three things. Number one, Jesus comes as a shepherd that is like David. And here, one of the things that I really want to point out is the fact that God is in control of all of history. And if he's in control of all of history, what it means is he is in control of everything throughout time. He is in control of all places. And he is in control of people. He is in control of people. And this is what Luke wants us to realize as he tells us that there's a decree that has been issued by Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Now, you've probably, or perhaps have read, that there is no specific decree that is found anywhere in the Roman history books. But historians tell us that at the end of his life, Caesar Augustus had incredible detailed statistics of every location throughout the Roman world. And then we also will see that he mentions Quirinius, and this is the first census of Quirinius. And if you know history, you realize that Quirinius actually became a governor of Syria in 6 AD, but Herod, he died in 4 BC. And so here there's a little bit of a question, but the way to kind of answer that is the word that is used first, protos, can mean first or before. And so it's probably before Quirinius is actually governor of Syria. So probably what has happened is we know that Caesar Augustus, he's had a reorganization of the whole Roman Empire, and that bit by bit, place after place, they are going ahead and already starting to re-register people, calling them each to their own hometown. That's what it says there. Everybody went to his own hometown. And why? So that they could register for taxation purposes. And so it tells us that Joseph, he goes from Galilee, Nazareth, and everybody knows that Jesus is from Galilee. Everybody knows he's from Nazareth, but he takes him to a place where a lot of people in Jesus' time did not know. He goes down to Judah, down to Judea, to the city of David, and then specifically, this is not Jerusalem, the city of David, but this is Bethlehem, the city of David. And he does that for a reason, and that's because... God being in control of history is moving things so that Jesus would be born where he had prophesied that he would be born. And everybody was expecting Jesus to be there. And normally at Christmas time, we'd kind of jump over to Matthew 1, Matthew 2, where the Magi come, and when the Magi come, and then Herod, he doesn't know his Bible. He's kind of like one of those, he's a king, he pretends to be a Jew, but he's not really living it out. And so he's kind of a sort of a fake Jew that's using his power to manipulate the Jewish people. So he doesn't even know his Bible. And he ends up asking the scholars where the Messiah is born. And they all say Bethlehem. Well, I prefer to say, well, let's go over to, to John. John actually is another way. We see even later that in John chapter 7, Jesus is down in Jerusalem. And there's a question about Jesus. And they're arguing over who he is. Is he the prophet? Is he the Messiah? And then it, there's this, some say, others said, but Scripture says. And, and the Scripture says, this is really important, because this is, God is the one who is in control of all truth. God's in control of true truth. It doesn't matter what other people think. If God says something, it is true. So we have some people that say, oh, this must be the prophet. Then others that are saying, some are saying, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And then others are turning around. You notice this. This cannot be the Messiah. Why? The Messiah, the Christ, is not from Galilee. So they only know of Jesus being from up in Nazareth. They know that he's Galilean, but the reader of John knows where Jesus has actually come from. And so they quote scripture, and they say, well, the scripture says, and this is where true truth is found. God has control of history. God is in control of truth. God has control of time. 
But it says, Scripture says from almost 700 years beforehand from the book of Micah, Scripture speaks true truth. And the true truth is that the Christ is not from Galilee. True. The Christ is from two things. He's from the offspring of David. He is a descendant of David. And secondly, Micah specifically says that Jesus is born in Bethlehem and the village of David. And why is this important? What does this have to do with our own children? Well, the, what this tells us about God is God is in control of all of history. God is in control of people. He's able to use the gossip of Nazareth to get Mary down to Bethlehem. God is able to orchestrate that the Caesar, the emperor of the entire Roman Empire, would reorganize in such a way that there would be a registration at the exact time, so God is in control of time, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem where he had said, 700 years beforehand. So we see God is in control of history, God is in control of time, God is in control of people, and God transcends all places. And so we struggle with our kids. Think about your kids. When your kids go off to college, or they go off as adults after they've graduated, do you realize that you have lost control? You realize that if your kids go to Boston, or they move to New York, or they move down to North Carolina, or they move to Texas, or they move out to California or to Seattle, that you, 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 you yourself, as a parent, basically have lost control of your kids. But you know who does have control? God. You've lost control of who they hang out with, You've lost control of who they date. You've lost control of what they're doing. You've lost control of everything. That's part of being a parent. But God has not lost control. So when you see your kids that have moved out and you sense that something is spiritually wrong with them and you begin to feel a little depressed and a little helpless that you cannot help your children, that you can only give a tidbit of advice and whether your kids listen to you or not, you have no control over. Whether they share with you what's going on or not, you have no control over. But the one person who does have control is God. God still has control. And you've got to remember, God is still their heavenly Father. God is the one who has made a covenant with you, with your family, and with your children. And if you have dedicated your child, or your child has been baptized, God is still in control, whether they're walking with the Lord or not. So you got to realize we have, can come to God who does have the power over where your children are, over who your children are around, over what is going on, no matter how much time goes by. God is in control. He's in complete control. God loves your children more than you do. It's hard to say, but God loves your children more than you do. He cares about them. He cares about them even more than we do. There's no hitting the wall of our love. It's not like we run the marathon race and we hit this wall and there's no more love. We have love that will go on infinitely. But what we do hit a wall is we hit the wall of power. Our ability to protect our children, our ability to influence our children, we just hit this wall where your children are off on their own. But God, he has control. So that's why this is really important. Secondly, Christ, he's a shepherd from all eternity. And as a shepherd from all eternity, he can relate to people at all different times. Part of what that means is that the story of your children is not over yet. God is a shepherd who is from all eternity and will go on into all eternity. So the children's story, the story, the life of your child is not over yet, even if it seems really bad. But what do we learn here? If we go back to Micah chapter 5, almost 700 years, this is about the time that Isaiah preached. Isaiah talks about the Messiah Jesus. He doesn't really know a lot. All he knows is what God tells him. And God tells him, look, Bethlehem, you are a little among all of the clans of Judah. And when we see Bethlehem and Judah, 
we automatically think back to King David and we should automatically think back to some of the prophecies of the Messiah coming. And then as he talks about the Messiah coming, as he gives his own prophecy of the Messiah coming, notice what he says. From you, from you will come forth. Will come forth. And notice these two things. A ruler in Israel who will shepherd his flock. A ruler, a king, and when it talks about a king, remember, in the Old Testament, shepherds speak about kings. And then he says he will shepherd his flock. And so as he talks about God shepherding his flock, it speaks about the imagery of God caring, God nurturing, God feeding, God seeking out the lost, God even healing, even binding up the broken. And then when it speaks about him being in the rule, it gives us the imagery that Jesus as shepherd also has all power. He has power. But notice what he promises. He promises that they will dwell securely and that he himself is their peace. And isn't that what you want for your children? You see, this is a promise that applies to us, but this is something that we all want for our children, whether our children are young and whether we're still holding them as babies or whether they are toddlers. We want our children to be safe and secure. What does he promise? What does he promise? Right there. They will dwell in security. Our kids go off to college. What do we want? We want them to be secure and to live in peace with God. Our kids are in high school, and there's all this peer pressure. What do you want? You want them to be protected, and you want them to live in security, securely, and you want them to have a peaceful life. And that's what he promises here is that he himself, Jesus Christ, will be their peace. So that's why we can pray to him to take care of our children. But notice this, this comes from all eternity. Notice, his coming is from long ago and from ancient of days. And these two words here, sometimes it will be translated, his coming is from eternity. And that's actually a correct interpretation. These two Hebrew words can mean from long ago in the past, from long, long, long ago in the past, ancient times, but it can also is used to be translated as eternity. And so I think that we can actually say, because we know what other aspects of the Bible say, what John, for example, says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it also says that before the foundation of the world, he was chosen. So we can really interpret this through the New Testament as saying, his coming is from all of eternity. Jesus Christ transcends all time. We saw that he has control over people. We saw that he has control over places. He can move. He can move Mary. He can move Joseph. He can move your children. And he can actually use bad people. He can use Herod. He can use Caesar Augustus. He can even use the gossip of the women in Jerusalem to work in the life of Mary and Joseph. He can also use the bad people who might be around our kids, the bad influences. And so we gotta pray for our children that God will use his power that transcends history, that transcends place, and here that transcends time, and that has control over history. But what does he say? He will shepherd his flock. And how will he shepherd his flock? How is God promised to take care of your children? He says they will dwell securely. They say he is their peace. You can pray that for God. But notice what he says here in verse 4. In verse 4, this is really crucial. This is why we can come to God. This is why we can come to God. You hear me? This is why we can come to God and pray that God will work in our children's lives young, Elementary age, high school, college, married. God can transcend all of that time. But notice what he says, verse 4. In the name of the Lord. Notice he repeats it twice. In the name of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord. The majesty speaks about his greatness. Majesty speaks about God's glorious greatness. But notice he says, he will shepherd in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. He repeats that twice. What does name of the Lord mean? Does it mean Yahweh? 
you know, using that specific word. No, the word name in the Old Testament actually refers to the character of God. What's the character of God? What do your children need? What do your children need? How can you approach God to take care of your children? How can you approach God to ask him to do what you cannot do when you hit the wall of parental protection? Here, name of God, character of God. God is gracious. God is compassionate. God is merciful. God is kind. God is good. God is forgiving. If you see your children going off and they're doing things that are disobedient to God, if you have a sense that they're living a life that is in complete disobedience to God, you can still come to God because he's a covenant God, but he's a God who is gracious, merciful, compassionate, kind, and he's forgiving. You can still go to God and ask him to pray, you get to take care of them, to protect them, to give them security, and to actually bring peace, godly peace, shalom peace into their lives. And thirdly, Thirdly, this is where it's really important to see Christ comes as a shepherd who cares. And he is the good shepherd. You know, what we got to realize is that when Jesus in John 10 said, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep, no one will snatch them out of my hand. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That the people that were listening to Jesus understood that he was making a claim to be the Messiah that was prophesied in Ezekiel 34. And so Ezekiel 34 talks about all of the bad kings, referring to them as bad shepherds, who have not taken care of God's people, whether it be in the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And then he promises, look, I have sent kings and the kings have failed. Even David failed. Even David failed. Solomon failed. Every king failed. Even Josiah failed. Even Hezekiah failed. Every king fails, but I'm going to send them a king, a shepherd, who will never fail. And he will take care. And who is it? I will give them one shepherd who is a prince. And notice how he does this. Verse 23, I will give them one shepherd, my servant David. My servant David will be prince among them. And so we see this balance between being a shepherd and being a prince. And this is what I really want you to know. When you come to God and you ask God to take care of your children, you are coming to Jesus as a shepherd who cares, who nurtures, who seeks the children out that are lost, who brings them back, whether they need to be brought back to God or whether they need to be restored into a relationship with you or other members of your family, or who heals Sometimes our children are kind of hurting inside. And then as the prince, the ruler, the king, he's a king who has power. So you get the shepherd who cares, nurtures, seeks out, heals, and restores, and the king who has a power that you do not have. He doesn't hit a wall. And so what he says here in this particular passage is really important for us when we can pray to God to take care of our children How are your children these days? What kind of worries do you have about your children? I mean, do you have times when you kind of just step back a little bit and you look at your kids and you watch them on Zoom and you get kind of concerned? You know, you see them upstairs and maybe they shut the door, maybe they're on the phone. Or maybe they just sit there and they just kind of stare off and they're a little depressed. Or, or, or maybe you can see that they're kind of hurt, that, you know, they can't see their friends and they go on social media, and then on social media, you know, they're really bothered because somebody maybe has said something bad to them. Or they're kind of discouraged or they're depressed. Does God care? Of course he cares. This is how we come to him. We need to come and to ask God to help. Whatever your concern is for your child, you can pray to God. And he will be their shepherd and he will be their king. So Ezekiel, Ezekiel here says, you are my sheep. Your children are God's sheep. Your children are the sheep of his pastor, the sheep of my pastor. And remember, you may be limited 
by location. Your kids, whether they're off at school, whether they're out with their friends, whether they're out doing sports, God is with them, you may not be. If your kids are on the internet, you may not be able to be there, but God is there with them. If your kids move away, you may not be there, but God is with them. His pasture is encompassing the whole entire world. No matter where your children go, no matter who your children are with, no matter what your children are do, doing, God is there, and every place that your child is is part of God's pasture. And your children are part of his sheep. And you've got to come to Jesus. This is what I'm encouraging. I'm encouraging you to come to Jesus and to pray. This is what I want like for you to do this whole next year, is to pray for your children. If you see your children walking away from God, or you see them kind of like slowly sliding away from you, sort of going off, having lost the connection with their family, Ezekiel, I will seek the lost and bring back the stray. And so however it is that your children get lost in their way, whether it be they're kind of meandering in life and they seem to have no direction, or whether they have just walked away from the Lord, or they seem to have a broken relationship, God can bring them back. Remember that parable? Parable of the shepherd who goes out and he seeks the one, leaves the 99, goes and he seeks the one, and he brings it back, that comes right from this passage, Ezekiel 34. And then what he says is, he will bind up the injured, and he will strengthen the weak. And think about the weakness. You know, we have our kids that are, they hang around with people at school, college, work, who perhaps can tempt them into, into sin can tempt them to walk away from the Lord, can tempt them in so many ways. And yet, it says here that God will strengthen them. So you need to pray for God to strengthen your children to be able to withstand, to be strong, to withstand temptation. But above all here, when it says he will bind up the injured, he's saying that if your children are ever hurt emotionally, mentally, they're depressed, they're discouraged, however it is, that he will heal them. So as we look at this particular Christmas package, passage, and we've just sat around with our children at home, at the tree, opening up presents, maybe your kids have come home. Christmas is a time of family. And Christmas is a time to really think about your kids and to think about your responsibility, but also to think about your limitations. We all have limitations. We hit the wall of our ability to protect our children, to care for our children, and that's why we need to kind of persistently pray, regularly pray. I'm not going to say make a New Year's resolution and pray every single day because if I say make a New Year's resolution to pray every single day, you know, you'll pray for four or five days and then you'll skip a day and then you'll kind of give up. But if I say pray persistently and regularly... You know, you pray a few days a week, you pray five days a week, you pray a couple of times a month. You'll keep at it, but keep praying for your children. Pray for them as they're young and before any problems arise. If you pray for your children before problems arise, they may not have to deal with problems. Secondly, if you kind of sense that something is not right with your children, but they're not telling you, they're not telling you what's bothering them, Bring that to God and pray to God and present your fears. Present what it is that you sense. Do you sense, for example, that your son may be living with his girlfriend or your daughter might be living with her boyfriend? Or do you sense that they're coming and they're telling you, oh, yeah, I go to church, I go here and here, but then you kind of have the sense that they're really not doing that? Or do you sense that your kids are kind of depressed, but they're not telling you why? Or they've got friendship relationships that are broken, and they won't talk to you? You kind of sense it. What you do is you bring your fears, what you sense in your heart, to God. And you present them to God. Present these problems to God. God knows what those problems are. He'll sort them out. But if you bring them to the Lord in prayer, He will come and deal with them. And above all, plead for protection of your children from God. And we live in an age 
the next 10 years, the last 10 years, where so many young people are falling away from the Lord, they need our protection. And so whether your children are young or your children are old, we need to really plead. We need to plead and beg and beseech God to protect our children. And the reason that you can do that is because of who God is. You can pray knowing who God is. You pray knowing that God is their heavenly father and that he loves them more than you do. You can pray knowing that Jesus is a shepherd and he cares for them and he knows how to protect them and he knows how to bring them back and he knows how to heal. But then finally, Jesus is also the king who has the power to do what you can't do. He has the power to control people. He has the power to control places. And he has the power that transcends all of time. And he can change your children. But you've got to keep at it in prayer. So that's what my suggestion for you is this week, is persistent prayer for our children in the next year. So let me pray with this benediction and, and close up. And I pray that you will actually pray this uh, for your own children. And this comes from Isaiah 40 and a little bit of Psalm 23. It's a consistent pattern. May Christ shepherd you and your children as his flock. And may he gather you and your children in his arms. And may Christ, our great shepherd, carry you and your entire family in his bosom close to his heart and may he gently lead you and your entire family beside still waters and may he feed you in green pasture of his word in jesus name i pray amen so don't forget tithes and offerings but also, don't forget uh, two dates. So I'll just kind of reiterate. January 15th, the virtual Zoom session, and then January 8th, Friday the 8th, will be uh, question-answer time with, uh, with the elders regarding, um, you know, anything that's in the budget. So we do pray. I do ask that you would do that. So may you have a great time. May you have a, a wonderful new year and um, celebrate it and stay nice and warm and safe. Amen.